Hello and welcome back to Neo Psychology with me, your teacher, Mr. Neo, the channel where I teach you psychology lessons to my wonderful students. Today, we are continuing with biopsychology. We're looking at lesson three, brain plasticity. What is brain plasticity? Let's find out, shall we? Starter. Do brain training and puzzle games work? Do they keep your mind sharp? Do you play these games? What have you found, right? Do you do a Sudoku or do you spend your all day playing Fortnite, right? What do you do? Do these things keep your brain sharp? Is it even possible to keep your brain sharp? This is what we're going to be having a look at today. Let's have a look at our learning objectives. Learning objective one, show comprehension and apply knowledge of brain plasticity. What does that mean? We don't know what that means at the moment, but we're going to find out. Identify and analyze research into brain plasticity and then discuss and evaluate brain plasticity as a whole. Let's start with learning objective one. Show comprehension and apply knowledge of brain plasticity. It's pages 160 to 161 in your textbooks. Brain plasticity refers to the brain's ability to change and adapt as a result of experience. This ability to change plays a role in the brain's development and behavior. Researchers used to believe that changes in the brain only took place during infancy and childhood, but more research, more recent research has demonstrated that the brain continues to create new neural pathways and alter existing ones to adapt to new experiences as a result of learning. So they suggest that the brain isn't just changing and creating new neural pathways as a child, it's also doing it as an adult and when you get an older. Neural or brain plasticity, neural or neuronal is just another word for brain, right? Neural plasticity or brain plasticity is the apparent ability of the brain to change and adapt its structures and processes as a result of experience and new learning. The brain would appear to, to be plastic, so it's not literally, it's like a metaphor, right? In the sense that it has the ability to change throughout life, right? Plastic can be molded, it can change, and that's what they're suggesting. The brain has plasticity, it has the ability to change. During infancy, the brain experiences a rapid growth in the number of synaptic connections. So synapses are those things, the synapse, so that it's, it's the, um, the neurons all connected together to make, uh, to send chemical, uh, to send chemical and electrical messages to the brain, like to each other, and they're all connected. So during infancy, the brain experiences a rapid growth, growth in the number of synaptic, uh, connections. It has peaking at approximately 15,000 at the ages of two to three years old, according to Gospick et al. in 1999. This equates to about twice as many as there are in the adult brain. As we age, rarely used connections are deleted and frequently used connections are strengthened, a process known as synaptic pruning. So pruning as in if you're pruning a tree, you're getting rid of the bits you don't want and you're leaving the bits you do, right? I'm pruning. And this is what it's called. It's synaptic pruning. So they're saying when you're about two, three years old, you have 15,000 connections. But the ones we don't use or don't use very often, they get pruned. They get cut away. They get deleted because we don't need them anymore. We haven't used them. So they've died or they, we've got rid of them. And the ones that are, we do use constantly, they're strengthened. It was originally thought that changes were restricted to the developing brain within childhood and that the adult brain, having moved beyond a critical period, would remain fixed and static in terms of function and structure. However, more recent research suggests that at any time in life existing neural connections can change or new neural connections can be formed as a result of learning and experience. This is plasticity or brain plasticity. So let's complete the definition, shall we? Plasticity. This describes the brain's tendency to change and adapt functionally and 
physically, so it's actually a physical change, as a result of experience and new learning. Lovely. Brain plasticity. This describes the brain's tendency to change and adapt functionally and physically as a result of experience and new learning. So if you have a look at the starter, can these brain um, tasks like Sudoku and, and brain testing games, can they help you stay, stay, keep your mind fit? The answer is yes. Brains can change and adapt functionally and physically as a result of new experience and new learning. So brain plasticity. Identify one thing you learned about brain plasticity. Why do you think learning about brain plasticity is important? Why is it important to know that the brain can change and it's and it's it's like plastic that can change and be formed? How does brain plasticity apply in real life? How does it apply in real life? I give the example of the game. You could think of something else and how it might be helpful to know this information. And then what questions has brain plasticity raised for you? What are you still wondering about? But I'm confident we can all tick off and we all understand what is brain plasticity. We all did that gap fill together. So let's tick it off. Done. Learning objective two, identify and analyze research into brain plasticity. Eleanor Maguire et al. in 2000 studied the brains of London taxi drivers and found significantly more volume of grey matter in the hippocampus than in matched control groups. This part of the brain is associated with the development of spatial and navigational skills in, human brain, in, in humans and other animals. As part of their training, London cabbies must take a complex test called the knowledge. Why I said it like that, I'm not sure. The knowledge, the body, which assesses their recall of the city streets and possible routes. So, um, taxi drivers, they used to have to learn the knowledge. They used to have to learn all the routes of London. So someone jumps in their cab and they go, take me to this place, and they would know how to get there just by the knowledge. Now technology has helped us. It's helped lots of people. Any old Uber driver now can put it in their little sat nav, follow the route and off they go. Before we didn't have sat navs, we didn't have it on our phones, we didn't have that sort of resources, that sort of technology, right? Before taxi drivers, they had to learn the knowledge. How did they get around places? They literally had to physically learn every single place in that certain area to know how to get there. It appeared that the result of the learn of this learning experience is to is to alter the structure of the taxi driver's brains. It is also noteworthy that the longer they had been in the job as a taxi driver, the more pronounced was the structural difference, a positive correlation. So it showed that there was actually a physical difference. A part of their brain in the navigation that's to deal with the navigational skills in the hippocampus was actually larger. It was more pronounced in those cabbies in comparison to a control group. So it showed that there were physical changes that were happening. A similar, a similar finding was observed by Dragansky et al. in 2006, who, imagine, who imaged the brains of medical students three months before and after their final exams. Learning-induced changes were seen to have occurred in the hippocampus and the parietal cortex, presumably as a result of the exam. So they took, they took a brain scan of all these medical students before their exam, three months before their exam, and then they did all of the cramming, the loads of revision, lots of learning, lots of revision, and then they tested them afterwards, and they found that there was actually a difference. Finally, Michelli et al. also found a larger parietal cortex in the brains of people who were bilingual compared to matched monolingual controls. So the fact that these people had learned a multiple language, they'd learned more than one language, and it had physically changed the structure of their parietal cortex. They had larger parietal cortexes. So literally changing the structure of your brain is possible through learning and through experience. How interesting is that? Here's a question. It's a research, it's a research methods question. A researcher compared the hippocampal volume of taxi drivers who drove different routes every day with bus drivers who followed the same route every day. The researcher used an unrelated t-test to analyze the data 
and a significant difference was found at the 0 0.05 level. Question. Explain two reasons why the unrelated t-test was an appropriate choice for this investigation. And then the extension question is, with reference to this investigation, explain what is meant by the phrase, a significant difference was found at 0 0.05 level. Right. Number one, explain two reasons why the unrelated t-test was an appropriate choice for this investigation. An unrelated t-test would be the most appropriate to use because the researcher was looking for a difference in the hippocampal volume in the brains of taxi drivers versus those of bus drivers. So a test of difference is appropriate such as the t-test. The experimental design was independent measures as the patients, sorry, as the participants were either taxi drivers or bus drivers and the level of measurement was interval data as the hippocampal volume was measured. Therefore, an unrelated test was required. Therefore, we got an unrelated t-test. Extension question. With reference to this investigation, explain what is meant by the phrase a significant difference was found at 0 0.05 level. Extension. This means that the hypothesis can be accepted. There is a difference in the, hippocampal, in, the hip, in the hippocampal volume of taxi drivers versus bus drivers. The value of the observed or calculated value would have been greater than the critical value at the level of the probability of 5% or 0 0.05, which is the minimum acceptable level of, for a significant result and means the likelihood of the results being due to factors other than if they were bus drivers or taxi drivers is less than 5%. The likelihood of making a type 1 error is also 5%. And there we go, that's the research into brain plasticity. Identify one thing you learned about um, research into brain, brain plasticity. Why do you think learning about brain plasticity is important? How does research into brain plasticity apply in real life? And then what questions has research into brain plasticity raised for you? What are you still wondering about? Write down your questions, ask me, put it in the comments. So learning objective two, identify and analyze research into brain plasticity. Are we happy to tick this off? Yes? Good. There we go. Learning objective three then, to be able to discuss and evaluate brain plasticity. Evaluation AO3. What are some of the strengths and weaknesses of this idea of brain plasticity? Practical application. Understanding the process involved in plasticity has contributed to the field of neurorehabilitation. Following illness or injury to the brain, spontaneous recovery tends to slow down after a number of weeks, so forms of physical therapy may be required to maintain improvements in functioning. Techniques may include movement therapy, electrical stimulation of the brain to counter the deficits in motor and or cognitive functioning that may be experienced following a stroke, for instance. This shows that although the brain may have the capacity to fix itself to a point, this process requires further intervention if it is to be completely successful. Now, is this a strength or a weakness? This is a strength. It's showing that how it's really practical. It's helping us. Understanding the brain plasticity helps us get a better understanding of the brain. Like this, in, like in this example, if you were to injure yourself, it's understanding that oh, if you're moving around more, if you're stimulating the brain, if you're if you're having electrical stimulation or movement therapy, it's going to help your brain as well to develop and to get better. If you were in some sort of accident or injury, negative plasticity, the brain's ability to rewire itself can sometimes have maladaptive behavioural consequences. Prolonged drug use, for instance, has been shown to result in poorer cognitive functioning as well as increased risk of dementia later in life. Now, is this a strength or a weakness? Right? It's a strength. Of course, drug use is is a bad thing but the fact that we understand things better now we understand that drug use can cause poor cognitive functioning and increase the chance of dementia is a good thing it's a good thing that we know these things so don't be like Snoop Dogg 
put down that reefer, right? It's bad for your cognitive functioning and it does increase dementia as well as schizophrenia. Playing video games. Playing video games makes many different complex cognitive and motor demands. Kuhn et al. in 2014 compared a control group with a video game training group that was trained for two months for at least 30 minutes per day on the game Super Mario. I would have loved to have been part of that study. Go and play Super Mario for 30 minutes a day and I'll pay you. Brilliant, yeah, I'll do that. They found a significant increase in grey matter in various brain areas including the cortex, hippocampus and cerebellum. This increase was not evident in the control group that did not play Super Mario. So you can tell your mum or dad, look, I'm, I'm actually increasing the volume of my cortex, hippocampal and cerebellum when I'm playing on the PlayStation, right? Or whatever. The researchers concluded that gaming had resulted in new synaptic transmissions in brain areas involved in spatial navigation, strategic planning, working memory and motor performance skills that were important in playing games successfully. Is this a strength or a weakness? Well, it's a strength. It's a strength because it's showing us that yes, doing something like playing a game or doing brain activities can in fact change the brain. It can increase brain volume. Right, outline one strength and one weakness, or two weak, uh, two strengths, if you want, of brain plasticity. Answer the question in a peel paragraph structure. Challenge, can you think of any f further criticisms of your own? Maybe you can have a look in the textbook. What does the, what does the textbook say? Identify one thing you learned from the evaluation. Why do you think learning about the evaluation is important? How does the evaluation apply in real life? Well, it, it gave us a better understanding and it showed us that, um, th that learning about brain plasticity is actually really helpful in everyday life, especially if you work in the work with people with brain injuries. And what questions has the evaluation raised for you? What are you still wondering about? And that's learning objective three, to be able to discuss and evaluate brain plasticity. We can tick that off. Good. Plenary, we're towards the end now. Video, easy, I go easy on you, like a video for a plenary. Watch this video regarding brain plasticity needed to use a spoon. Something as simple as using a spoon and eating it seems like a really simple task, but actually, you need so many different parts of the brain in order to do this. Watch the video, it's really interesting, and check it out. And that was lesson three. Thank you for joining the lesson today. We've learned lots today. Uh, today was lesson three, brain plasticity, right? We learned lots. Thank you for coming. Be sure to write up your notes for next lesson. Well done, my neuropsychologist. Great work today, as usual. I've been Mr. Neo. God bless and peace. I'm feeling like Will. I feel like a prince. I'm feeling myself. I'm loaded with bills. Because I was not blessed with no Uncle Phil. Don't know how it feels. I wanted to flex. They told me to chill. I'm making a flip. My life is a flick, now load up the flip yeah.